and start presenting. So we've talked about arthropods and the last go around, um, I talked about um, chelicerates, most of which are in a subgroup arachnida that are parasitic. And that includes the mites and the ticks uh, in uh, the class of cari. Uh, the next big subdivision of the arthropoda is crustaceans. And uh, there's actually more parasitic crustacea than you might uh, realize. Most of them are marine, uh, but there are, uh, there's at least one group that's pretty abundant in freshwater and uh, one group that's actually made it uh, into um, uh, the niche of parasitizing land animals, uh, including um, some that can potentially infect dogs and cats and uh, are known to infect humans. So we'll get at least a little bit of, uh, you know, proper creepiness here in this lecture. Okay, crustacea are the most diverse group of arthropods in the oceans. Uh, there are plenty of freshwater ones as well. Everything from crawfish to microscopic copepods. And there's even some that have adapted to a terrestrial lifestyle uh, one big group of crustaceans called the isopods includes a branch that's crawled out onto land. Uh, I grew up calling them roly polies, although you might have grown up called, uh, calling them pill bugs or something like that. Uh, there's about 55,000 known species. Uh, there's three distinct tagmata, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Uh, in a number of these, the head and the thorax are kind of fused. Uh, so if you've ever eaten crawfish or taken a close look at a lobster, that front part uh, that they call the head is actually the head and the thorax together. Uh, collectively, it's technically called the cephalothorax. And then the abdomen is what people call the tail. The abdomen is the part uh, that you peel and eat. Um, on others, you can see those three distinct tagmata more clearly, but in the ones that you're likeliest to have encountered before, the head and the thorax fuse together. Uh, there's a little terminal segment on the abdomen that's technically not a segment. It's called the telson. Uh, the very tip of a crawfish tail would be the telson. The appendages are biramus, although one or the other branches is sometimes lost. Uh, but the uh, walking legs, for instance, have gill branches on them. Um, the, uh, the antennae are forked and double. And there's two pairs of antennae on the head and then three pairs of mouth parts, appendages that are modified for processing food. Crustaceans share a larval stage called a nauplius. Uh, this is a fairly typical nauplius with three pairs of appendages. Uh, one is sticking out in kind of a V shape. Uh, the second pair is biramus. And on the lower left, you can see both branches. Uh, you can't really see the um, biramus appendage on the upper right side. Uh, if you'll pardon me, I'm going to let somebody in. Morning, James. All right. Good morning, James. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, we were just talking about crustacea. And there are crustaceans whose adult stages look almost unrecognizable. What they share, and in many cases, the main thing that allows us to classify them as crustaceans is um, an early larval stage with kind of a pear-shaped body and three pairs of appendages uh, called a nauplius. Uh, it's actually not too uncommon to see these in freshwaters mm -hmm. Uh, typically, if I have a class look at samples of pond water, uh, at least one of these is going to turn up, sometimes more. I'm not sure if they're larval freshwater shrimp or larval crawfish or 
larval copepods or something else, but they tend to look a lot like this. And you'll see a case of a crustacean whose adult stage is so modified it's not obvious what the heck it even is, but that nauplius stage is pretty common, and in this case it enables us to classify these things correctly. I'm not even going to try to get into the diversity of free-living crustacea. You know, we've got everything from crabs and shrimp and lobster to brine shrimp uh, to free-living isopods and copepods and a cat's behind. Move. Move, you animal. Okay. Right. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, but there's five groups of crustaceans that have parasitic members. Three of them are primarily free-living, but they've got some parasitic taxa in them. Copepods, isopods, and cirripedes. Uh, copepods, uh, very common in freshwater. Uh, you may have seen them before. Isopods include a lot of marine and some freshwater species, but also include the roly-polies. Cirripedia is the barnacles. And... They're best known as free-living taxa, but they've also got a number of parasitic species. Two groups within the crustacea are solely parasitic. In fact, they're so modified that it's not obvious where they belong on the family tree. Uh, that's pentastomids, affectionately known as tongue worms, and branchi branchiura, affectionately known as fish lice. So here's a free-living copepod. Um, this is less than a millimeter, maybe a millimeter long tops. So you can barely see them with the naked eye as little kind of jumping specks. Uh, but they can be extremely abundant in aquatic habitats. And this particular one, very common in lake water or pond water around here. Every time I go sample places like... Um, uh, Beaver Fork or Lake Conway, I find some of these. Uh, this one's called Cyclops, uh, so-called because there's a central eye in the middle of the head over to the right. You can see it as a kind of dark spot. Uh, this is a female carrying uh, paired egg sacs, uh, those things that are kind of bulging out um, at about her, you know, seven o'clock and ten o'clock positions. Uh, those are egg sacs, and they're very common in freshwater, very important in freshwater food webs. Uh, small fish eat these guys. And then others are marine, and they can be extremely abundant in marine habitats where there is uh, a copious nutrient supply fueling the growth of algae for them to feed on. If you've got conditions like that, you can have millions of these per cubic meter of ocean water. Uh, Calanus is the name of this one, and it's sometimes said to be the most abundant animal genus on Earth. And, of course, these get fed on by small fish and you know, jellyfish and just about any predator uh, will chow down huge numbers of freshwater copepods. Uh, so they're a critical link in oceanic food webs, um, you know, supporting the growth of larger organisms. Uh, don't know if anyone was going to ask, but these are not quite the same as krill. Krill are in a different crustacean group, uh, but certainly big filter feeders might well feed on both. But about a third of all known copepod species are parasitic. Um, they've evolved independently several times over, and they parasitize every known phylum in the marine biosphere, and they're the most diverse parasites of marine fish. You're looking at down below, that's a male, and above, that's a female of the salmon fish louse, uh, Lepidoptheris salmonis. Uh, there is threat to farm salmon, which is a $12 billion industry, so, you know, a threat to... The salmon industry is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, the pair of long brown stringy things that are sticking uh, out of the female to the right, those are egg strands. 
Uh, they're basically the same structure as those egg sacs that we saw uh, here in Cyclops. Uh, the head is flattened for easy attachment to the skin. Uh, the uh, fish, uh, the um, salmon louse, not really a louse, of course, uh, sucks blood with piercing mouth parts. And the eggs hatch into nauplii. Uh, they molt into a free-swimming stage called a copapodid because it looks like a free-living copepod. That has to find a host and it will molt, molt several times on the host, going through stages called chalima stages, and then ultimately uh, pre-adult and adult stages. Uh, the adults are good enough swimmers that they can swim from one host to the other, and on the host they'll mate, and the female will start cranking out lots of eggs. This is another case where a disease spreads most quickly in crowded conditions. Uh, in the wild, I think numbers are kept in part under control by the fact that salmon may not come into contact with each other very often. Uh, but in a salmon pen, which oftentimes you make by just putting a big fence right across a small bay or a fjord, uh, where the salmon are crowded, lice can spread quite easily. Um, and for the past 10 years or so, we've started seeing resistant salmon lice because, you know, that natural selection gets you every time. Hmm. Maybe we should believe in that. Nah, crazy talk. There's others that have gone so far down the rabbit hole that you can hardly recognize what they are. Uh, Panelids... Um, you know, spend a little time as free-living larvae. Uh, they'll develop as juveniles on another host. In this case, it's a flatfish. And then they'll swim up and find a definitive host, um, a cod in this case. And they'll bury their head in the host flesh, uh, leaving only the egg strands to wave outside. And the head grows these branches and develops into this root-like kind of structure. And if you didn't have the full life cycle, you would be hard-pressed to tell that the thing is an arthropod in the first place, uh, because the adult body is basically a sack cranking out eggs at one end and rooting in the cod flesh with the other. Uh, and here's one that I could find that's a parasite of Antarctic whales, Panella balanopterae, uh, which can reach 30 centimeters uh, you can see that sack-like body and then egg strands coming out of the body. And the head is, you know, rooted in uh, the whale's flesh. The term mesoparasites is sometimes used for parasites that are partly internal and partly external. We've talked about ectoparasites and endoparasites. Meso is for the ones that are, you know, partly inside and partly outside of the host. So oh, there's a mesoparasitic copepod for you. Okay, pentastomids are really weird. Uh, the anatomy's been so reduced, they've only got four appendages, and they're just little stubs. Uh, there have actually been people who used to classify these in a separate phylum uh, because they no longer look an awful lot like arthropods. Uh, one genus, Linguatula, uh, looks like a tongue if you're on drugs. Uh, so pentastomids are sometimes called tongue worms, although not all species look like tongues. Uh, there's four little stubby appendages that you can't even clearly see in this specimen. And then there's a mouth at one end of the body. They parasitize the respiratory tract of... A lot of them in reptiles, they'll tend to live in places like snake lungs, because if you have worms in hippopotamus eye sockets, you have to have worms in snake lungs. It's, you know, just only natural. Uh, some will parasitize birds. There are some uh, will parasitize mammals. Uh, humans can actually get this by accident, and in some human populations, it's surprisingly common. Uh, mercifully, it tends not to be common um, around here. 
Uh, Linguatula serrata is a species that infects dogs and cats. Um, now, for the benefit of Nick and Abby, I'll mention that I've never heard of this uh, being particularly common here, uh, but the study that I came across that looked at feral dogs in Cairo uh, found that up to 60% of male dogs were infected. Uh, the reason is that you get Linguatula serrata uh, when a dog or another animal consumes uh, raw liver or raw offal. You know, offal is the intestines and all the stuff that the butcher shop discards. So if you have dogs that are scavenging on butcher shop remnants, uh, they can get this. Uh, dogs that eat uh, dog food are at much less risk, although they could still get it from, uh, you know, eating wildlife or something like that. Uh, Linguatula arctica is apparently quite common in the nasal passages of reindeer. So if you're wondering why Rudolph had a red nose, it's evidently this is the reason why. Nobody's looked into that. that Rudolph might have been able to light Santa's sleigh because of a symbiotic relationship. Lynn Margulis would love that. You know, just like bioluminescent squid, it's not the squid that glows, it's symbiotic bacteria in the squid's organs that make it glow. Maybe it's the same thing happening here. Maybe it's a new species of tongue worm uh, that's bioluminescent that made Rudolph able to guide Santa's sleigh. Why do I think of shit like this? I'll do my, uh, my, fi my final essay about that. <laughs> Okay, I, I think you should. I think you should. Right. Um, eggs are generally either sneezed out or if they can be, you know, snorted, swallowed, and defecated out. And the eggs get eaten by herbivorous mammals. Uh, juvenile stages in the herbivore... Um, they're technically nymphs, not larvae. Uh, nymph means that, you know, they're small, but their anatomy is not grossly different from the adults. They don't undergo metamorphosis. And the nymphs will burrow into the herbivore's gut walls, lymph nodes, mesenteries, you know, the tissue that suspends the intestines. Uh, they'll burrow into the liver and they'll kind of curl up. You can see on the right how those things are curled and they form little nodules. Um, and then when a carnivore eats infected tissues of an herbivore, uh, like a street dog eating cast off guts from a butcher shop or something like that, uh, they will transform into adults in the carnivore's body. Uh, so over there on the left, uh, that's a cross section through one of these nodules. And on the right, those are some uh, whole nodules uh, removed from an herbivorous host. I think in this particular case, it was a monkey. So that's what they look like. It is possible for humans to get infected with these, although we don't seem to be usual hosts. Uh, visceral linguatuliasis is what they call it when humans get infected with uh, juvenile uh, linguatula and they form cysts in our own livers and intestinal walls and places like that. Um, nasopharyngeal linguatuliasis is when we get adults up our noses. Uh, both tend to be most common in populations that uh, eat a lot of raw meat or raw offal. Uh, it's very common in Somalia because one of the local dishes is um, chopped up raw guts. Um, I'm sure they make it taste wonderful, but uh, you're at risk of um, uh, getting uh, linguatula there. Um, this is a picture in a case study of a patient from Africa uh, who'd come down with visceral porocephaliasis because she's infected with a different species not linguatula, but porocephalus. And she had apparently been coming into contact with snakes. Uh, if you come into contact with snake guts and snake feces, uh, you could be infected with either 
um, the the juveniles, or potentially you could come down with the case of adult uh, infection. If you look in the little uh, inset over at the lower left, uh, that's a close-up of what some of those nodules look like, and um, you can see the individual worms that are coiled up in kind of a C-shape. Uh, so what you look for is tiny crescents or you know, little broken rings. Um, but again, this tends not to be common in uh, the United States. Uh, I mean, as long as you, you know, this is another thing where as long as you cook your food and wash your hands, you're probably at very low risk for it. So there. Oh, incidentally, I, this is cited on Wikipedia. I was looking for a little background information, and apparently when they did autopsies in Berlin in the 1920s, uh, they found that something like 12% of all people actually had this in their livers. Uh, possibly the local cuisine involved eating raw meat or something like that. I'm not sure how they got it, uh, but mild infections are often asymptomatic. Only in heavy infections do you start getting symptoms uh, the problem is that antiparasitic drugs don't do very much, and if there's lots of them, you may need surgery. Right. So much for the tongue worms. Uh, fish lice are crustaceans that are very heavily modified for parasitism. Um, most of the mouth parts are modified for piercing because these suck blood and body fluids uh, from the outsides of fish. Um one pair of mouth parts is modified for suckers. Uh, you can see eyes up at the top, sorry, and then, you know, down into the side, you can see those two uh, kind of open circles. Uh, those are the suckers that fish lice use to attach to hosts. Uh, they can leave and come back incidentally. And there the arrow shows one on a fish uh, they parasitize almost every freshwater fish um, in their range. Uh, they can parasitize commercially farmed species. Um, sorry, the cat is periodically stepping on my mouse pad. Um, they can cause tissue damage. They can be vectors for bacterial infection. And, you know, just like any wound... Uh, the bites of fish lice can be a conduit for secondary bacterial infection. Uh, so you really don't want to have these on your, on your fish. Here's a clever way to uh, stop them. Males and females will mate while they're on the host, and the female will leave the host every few days and swim down to the substrate. Uh, she'll lay them if she can, on a hard substrate. And so I've heard that in fish ponds, you can sometimes reduce the incidence of fish lice. If you've got a pond with a nice muddy bottom, you can put some boards down on the bottom of the pond. Uh, the female fish lice will swim down and they'll lay their eggs on the boards. And then you pick up the boards uh, every few days and... I guess you could leave them out to dry or something like that. I'm not sure how you treat the boards, uh, but the point is that you can get rid of the eggs before they hatch into the swimming larvae. Uh, so there's a nice example. You know, we've talked about trying to find clever ways to break the life cycle at a weak point, and this is one of them. If anybody ever goes into the fish farming business, this may be good to know. And yeah, I came across some work coming out of South Africa uh, that shows that fish, fish parasites can be accumulators of heavy metals. And I'm resisting the urge to work in a bad pun and then immediately launch into victim of changes by Judas Priest. You know, when the words heavy metal are said, you know what my reflex tends to be. Uh, but in this case, we'll keep it professional. Uh, the bodies of fish lice tend to build up metal concentrations from the environment, and it's been proposed that this might make them useful in biological monitoring. You know, if you're worried about levels of heavy metal in a lake, 
Uh, you can catch some fish and you don't even have to kill the fish. You can pull off the fish lice and, you know, grind them up and sample them uh, for heavy metal concentrations, you know, which is kind of neat. I ought to tell Reed Adams that. Uh, he's had at least one student that did a little Paris, a little project on the incidence of fish lice on, I can't remember what the host species was, but, um, uh, but yeah, interesting and elegant and kind of creepy looking critters. Not half so creepy as the parasitic barnacles. Uh, these are some free living barnacles. Barnacles are all marine, by the way. Uh, these are, they're called goose barnacles because it used to be believed that they were baby uh, geese. Uh, in fact, they are crustaceans. In this group, there's a muscular stalk that attaches to a substrate permanently. Uh, there's some shelly plates that surround most of the body. That's those white things that you see. And then the appendages come out from between the plates and when barnacles are submerged, the appendages will come out and sweep through the water, uh, pick up food particles, pull them in between the plates, and uh, kick them down to the mouth. Uh, anatomically speaking, barnacles are standing on their heads, uh, kicking food into their mouth with their, uh, with their legs. Um, so, yeah, back in the early 1800s, barnacles were considered to be mollusks uh, because their anatomy is so unlike uh, crustaceans. Um, but um, I can't remember who worked out that they are, in fact, crustaceans, but uh, Charles Darwin actually wrote four volumes on barnacles. Uh, surprisingly interesting reading if you're into barnacles. Uh, we can tell they're crustaceans, by the way, because they develop from perfectly good nauplius larvae. Uh, the nauplius larva will swim around a bit, uh, molt into a new type of larva called a cypress, and it's the cypress that will glue its head down on a rock and transform into an adult barnacle. Most barnacles, free-living. They'll attach to rocks or to driftwood or something like that and never harm anybody. Uh, there are some genera that are commonly found on uh, whales, for example. Uh, they can grow on living uh, substrates. Uh, barnacles like this are mostly just commensals. They don't seem to do much harm. Uh, but some of these have gone from just being commensals to being parasites. And I actually wrote a paper with a friend of mine back when I was in grad school in 1994. Um, I had a good friend who was working, uh, uh, studied sharks in grad school, and he'd come across an Antarctic dogfish uh, that had this weird growth coming out of its body. And I found out that it was Analasma squalicola. It's a bar barnacle that settles on... Uh, sharks, as it grows, it burrows into the uh, shark flesh. And instead of just forming a plain old attachment, uh, that burrowing area starts growing some roots and starts absorbing nutrition from the digestion of the dogfish's flesh. Uh, that purple squiggly stuff that you're seeing, uh, there's two analasma right there. That's two individuals. Uh, that purple squiggly stuff is appendages, but they're not used for feeding anymore. Um, that creamy stuff that you're seeing is masses of eggs. And surrounding all of that, you've got that brown tissue is the mantle where the plates would be, except analasma has reduced those plates to, I think, uh, nothing. So we've gone from respectable free-living barnacle that only attaches to things to barnacles that attach to um, larger marine critters but don't do them much harm to analasma, which attaches to marine critters and has shifted to a uh, parasitic life cycle. Rather horrifying, actually. But yeah, if anybody wants to look in the journal called Systematic Parasitology, 
uh, from 1994. I co-authored a paper on Analasma squalicola uh, with my partner in crime, Doug Long. Right. And then the weirdest of all are called rhizocephalan barnacles. They begin as perfectly respectable nauplius larvae. They'll swim around for a bit and then attach to a crustacean host, most commonly a crab. And once they're on the crab, they completely forget that they are freaking crustaceans at all. And they grow into this weird network of filaments. It's like a you know, the parasite thinks it's a damn fungus that grows all through the crab's body. Uh, this one is only shown on the left-hand side. Um, in life, it would parasitize the right-hand side as well. It's just shown on the left for clarity. And it grows into this network of filaments called the interna. Uh, it absorbs food from the crab's tissues. In particular, it goes right for the gonads. Uh, a crab that's been parasitized with rhizocephalans is typically unable to reproduce. Uh, we've seen this in some flukes and snails before. It's called parasitic castration. And the thing will sprout a sac-like growth on the outside uh, under the crab's tail. Uh, the sac is called the externa and the filaments are called the interna. And here's where it gets freaking creepy. The rhizocephalin starts screwing with the host hormones. Uh, there's an infected crab. Uh, crabs normally keep the tail very tightly tucked under the cephalothorax, uh, but there the tail is brought forward a little bit, and you can see a big externa uh, under the tail. This is where the crab would keep its egg sac. Uh, an infected crab stops molting and it starts protecting the externa as if it were the crab's egg sac. Um, in fact, males will start protecting the externa as if it were an egg sac too, uh, because the host has, the parasite is screwed with the host hormones so much that the male doesn't, is, isn't behaving like a male anymore. And this could have something to do with the fact that the rhizocephalin has swallowed the damn gonads as well. And I tell you, if somebody wants to make like the next, you know, the, the successor to the alien movie franchise, they ought to come up with an alien that infects humans and does this to them, like grows through the entire human body and produces this strange growth that infected people start swaddling and trying to care for because they think it's a baby. That would be a truly horrifying movie. Oh, last group, isopods. Uh, that includes many marine species. It includes terrestrial pill bugs or roly polies like this one, which I'm sure you've all seen. That's actually a crustacean, not an insect. Some of them are parasitic. Here we've got some that have latched onto a fish from the Mediterranean. Uh, that's a fairly simple ectoparasite. And probably the most notorious parasitic isopod enters a fish's mouth, swims in through the gills, latches onto the tongue, uses its piercing mouth parts to drain blood from the main blood vessel supplying the tongue. Uh, once it's done that, the tongue wastes away, but the adult isopod is almost exactly the same shape as the tongue. So the isopod just clamps onto the stump of the old tongue, and the fish can move it, and the fish basically uses it as a tongue. Uh, so this is a fish where the tongue has been replaced by the parasite, but the parasite continues to function as a tongue. Somebody should write a story about that, where a parasite, like, latches onto your leg, makes your leg wither away, but grows into a strong and stiff peg-like structure that replaces your leg. You know, Stephen King needs to uh, take this class. There's some really cool things he could use. Right. 
Uh, that would appear to be that. Wait, can't, please stop. Nice kitty. All right. Do I have any questions, comments, rotten fruit? Nature is scary, and I live by that. Nature's scary, and I live by that. <laughs> Nature's scary, and you love that. I live by that. Like that is like my li my life motto is that nature terrifies me. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why they call nature a mother. I don't know. I, well, I would suggest that being terrified of nature might be a handicap if you're going to be a biologist, but then, you know, sometimes a mild dose of terror adds deep fascination to it. So I have a healthy respect for nature. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. You know, respect and fascination uh, can actually be quite beneficial in a career like this. Okay. Anybody else? Will you send us a list of posters again, updated, and the tests? Uh, we'll do. Thank you much. All right. Where you are getting firebombed, uh, not firebombed, uh, lecture bombed by a different cat. That's Fern. All right. I'll stop recording. And we're done.